Hello everyone and welcome to another LD webinar. Today we have Helen Cookson presenting. Helen is a Senior Associate in Trowers and Hamlin's Privacy and Information Law Group and also works with her employment team. So now I hand you over to Helen. Thank you, Mariana, and thank you everybody for joining this um, webinar message. I'm going to be talking today about the GDPR. What I hope to do is try to demystify some of the complexities of this new area of law and to provide you with some guidance on the really important things that you need to be thinking about in the social care sector. So what I will cover today is exactly what the GDPR is and what it's intended to do, what the key legal changes are, the key principles that you need to understand if you're going to engage with this legislation, and to talk a little bit about the recommended action plan that's recommended by the Information Commissioner's Office, which I'll refer to as the ICO from now on, um, which explains what you need to do to prepare for May this year, 25th of May 2018, which is when the GDPR comes into effect in the UK. So I have a few key messages that I'll be returning to later on in this presentation. This is a really important legal change and it's very important that you take action to protect your organisation. But what I would say is that there is an awful lot of hype out there about the GDPR, about the amount of money that you need to spend in order to comply with it. And actually the ICO themselves are a little bit concerned about some of the sales techniques which have been used by organisations to try and get um, all sorts of companies and organisations to comply with GDPR moving forwards. And they've launched a myth-busting blog which is worth a, a look if you are contacted by any organisations and you want to work out exactly what is required and what isn't. One thing I would say is that if you already have a good data protection regime in place in your organisation, a lot of this is going to be very familiar to you indeed and you probably find yourself wondering just how much has really changed. There are a few new terms here. Um, there are a few new concepts, but really it's very, very similar to the regime which you'll be familiar with. And the last message is, obviously we're at the beginning of February now, the implementation date is the 25th of May, but there is still time to get your organisation in the right place for that May deadline and you don't have to panic. So a few key introductory points. Um, as I've already mentioned, the GDPR will be directly applicable um, into UK law on the 25th of May 2018. You may be um, aware of this already, but I think it's a point worth making that the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation, is not a regulation in the sense that you will probably have come across before in UK law. So usually when EU law is introduced, we have a directive which will then be introduced into UK law through a regulation. So, for example, we have the Working Time Directive, which is implemented via the Working Time Regulations. The GDPR is instead an EU regulation, which has immediate effect um, on the implementation date without member states having to do anything at all. Um, it applies not only to public bodies, but to all organisations and all individuals within the member states. And it's quite an unusual mechanism for introducing new European legislation. The purpose behind it is to bring data protection legislation across Europe um, into the 21st century. The previous directive was made in the mid 1990s. And if you think our current Data Protection Act in the UK dates back to 1998. So that's a time before most people had um, internet access at work. For example, people were still using dial-up connections at home before broadband, before social media, and before the, certainly long before anybody thought about um, smartphones. So we have seen the world of data transform 
so far this century, and there's an urgent need to bring our legislation into line with that. Thinking for a moment about what the GDPR does, it's, it is widening the scope of the existing legislation. It's doing that in a number of different ways. More personal data is going to be covered by the new regulation, and I'll, I'll go on to explain that in more detail. It's also widening in, in its territorial extent. That's because at the moment, the legislation only applies to data controllers who are based within the European Union. Moving forwards, this legislation applies where data is being processed of European Union citizens and it's been, um, been processed within the EU regardless of where the processor or the data, sorry, the data controller is based. And of course, that's significant because many of these large organizations are actually based outside the EU in America and elsewhere around the world. And for the first time, this legislation is applying not only to data controllers, but also to data processors. Up until now, the obligations rested purely on data controllers, but there's a belief that that means there are gaps in the compliance and issues can fall between stools, between controllers and processors. So now everybody will be covered um, by the legislation, although the overwhelming burden of compliance will still rest on the shoulders of data controllers. The GDPR is also introducing new rights for individuals. And you can expect to see increasing amounts of publicity in relation to the new rights which all data subjects will have. And finally, there are greater enforcement powers for authorities, and I'll explain what those are and what that potential impact is as well. Although the GDPR has an effect without the need for member states to take any more action, the regulation does contain some scope for member states to introduce um, their own variations on the legislation. And also, not least because of Brexit, the UK government has decided to introduce a new Data Protection Act. This is currently in a bill form. It's um, had its first reading in Parliament and it's now in the House of Lords. It's been described as a complex and ugly piece of legislation. It runs to some 265 pages. It's quite tricky to read because in order to understand it, you have to have the regulation by your side as well as looking at the new data protection bill. And it's proving to be quite controversial because like the EU withdrawal bill, it contains very wide Henry VIII powers. So those are powers for um, the government um, to amend legislation without it having to introduce new primary legislation in front of Parliament. The bill was announced in August and it meets um, not only um, the requirement to ensure that GDPR is going to be fully introduced into UK law, but it also meets manifesto promises that were made by um, the Tories in their manifesto. The intention of the new data protection bill, which also covers um, some matters which relate purely to law enforcement agencies, which I'm not going to cover um, in this presentation, is to ensure that the UK maintains its gold standard when it comes to the protection of personal data and in relation to e-commerce generally. And that's identified as being important for a number of different reasons. It's to ensure that the public can continue to have trust in how their data is used. And it's recognised that at the moment, the misuse of personal data through nuisance calls and so on is a serious concern for a number of individuals. And of course, within the charity sector, we have the scandal of charity fundraising, which has raise a number of um, concerns about the way the charity sector was using personal data. It's seen as being important to future trade. I know some people might have wondered why we are making such a fuss about complying with the GDPR, given that we are due to leave the European Union in fairly short order. But in order for European countries to be able to send us 
data beyond the Brexit date, we have to have a regime which is equivalent to theirs. So if we are to maintain the UK's prominence in terms of insurance services, financial services, and somewhere that can offer headquarters for large European companies, it's important that we have data protection regime which mirrors the one which will continue to exist in the EU in any event. And finally, not least because of the law enforcement matters, which I've already um, referred to, but also with an em increased emphasis on organisations ensuring that data is held securely. The government intends that this new legislation will be important for security of the country moving forwards. So what exactly is the GDPR changing? Um, there are two key themes that we've identified from the GDPR. First is a focus on control, and by control I mean the control that individuals have in relation to their personal data. And this has been achieved in a number of different ways. By tightening the um, obligations on data controllers in relation to consent, and to make the requirements in relation to consent, which are already quite um, strict anyway, um, clearer. To improve transparency for individuals, the idea being that if as a data subject, you know who has your data, how they are using it, and who they are sharing it with, it will be easier for you to exercise your rights to object to that processing or to limit exactly what is being done with your personal data. And the legislation introduced new rights for individuals, which I'm going to come on and talk about later, perhaps the most important um, of which is um, a new right to withdraw consent to processing. And there are also rights to portability of data and, and to object to processing of data for particular purposes. The flip side of that increased control for individuals is a focus on accountability for organisations. And this is being addressed in a number of different ways. Perhaps the most eye-catching way that it's been done is by increasing the potential risks for organisations if they fail to comply with the GDPR. The maximum fines which can be levied are increasing to 20 million euros or 4% of annual global turnover. Those are for serious breaches, for example, if data was sent outside the protected EU regime um, in, in a way which breaches the legislation or for very significant breaches of certain provisions. More minor breaches, for example, a failure to notify a breach within the prescribed timescales of the legislation can result in a lower level fine, but that's still capped at a very high level. That's going to be 10 million euros or 2% of annual global turnover. What I would say as an aside is that it's these, this new increased um, fine regime, which has been used by many organisations who are trying to sell GDPR services as a way of causing alarm and suggesting that it, this is a massively increased business risk. It is, of course, the case that these um, fines may be levied for serious breaches moving forwards. At the moment, the maximum fine is £500,000. That A fine at that level has never been levied by the ICO, and I think that's important to bear in mind. And the ICO themselves are stressing that they do not see this regime as being about them suddenly imposing enormous fines all over the place. What, but what they want to see is organisations taking their responsibilities really seriously and working to improve their accountability. And if they can see that you are doing that and you're striving to compliance and you've put in place um, the steps that they recommend, you don't have to worry about this new fine regime in all reality. What you do have to focus on is the new requirement to evidence compliance. As things stand at the moment, you're obliged to comply with the Data Protection Act, but you don't have to be able to demonstrate on a day-to-day -day business basis that you're actually doing that. That is going to change and that is perhaps from a business point of view the most significant change which this legislation is introducing. One of the ways that that has been done is by a new concept called privacy by design 
And this is because there's been a feeling across the European Union that organisations have tended to approach data protection as a one-size-fits-all compliance issue, which is fairly low down most organisations' list of priorities. Now, you must look at your personal um, business organisation and you must decide how and the steps, how you're going to comply with GDPR and the steps which you need to take. The idea is that the, the compliance for one organisation will be different from the next because of your ind individual and particular requirements. So it's that tailored approach which raises the profile of GDPR compliance, which is really important. So coming back to those key messages again, just to really reinforce that. Yes, this is an important change, but don't believe the hype. What you know already about data protection compliance is going to stand you in very good stead, and there is plenty of time for you to get this right. Before I go on to talk about the GDPR itself, I think it's worth just spending a moment looking at how data protection legislation works and what the underlying principles of it are. And the reason for doing that is the most common issue which our team is finding as we work with organisations towards GDPR compliance is that there are some common misunderstandings and confusions which we come across a lot. And if you have um, this misunderstanding of how the legislation works, it tends to be very difficult for you to then understand the full implications of GDPR and the steps that you need to take. So working through the different elements, this is legislation which applies to personal data, that's data which relates to living individuals. It's an obvious point, but sometimes it gets lost in all of the concern um, about compliance, that it does only apply to that personal information. Um, some people um, get very concerned um, about applying the personal data principles right across all data in the organisation, and you're creating unnecessary work for yourself if you do that. The really important thing to understand is that we have two key sets of concepts within data protection legislation. We have the principles which are set out in legislation and which I'm going to explain in a moment. And these determine how you have to process data. It has to be processed in a lawful manner. For example, you have to have retention periods and, and so on. You also have to have a condition which allows you to process personal data in the first place. Think of this as a key which is going to unlock the door to allowing you to process data. But that's all it is. It's giving you a lawful basis for processing and then the processing which you undertake is subject to the principles which are set out. What we often find is that there is a confusion between what are conditions and what are principles. And if you muddle those things up, it, you're going to find yourself increasingly getting um, diverted from where you need to be in order to ensure good compliance. So looking then at what comprises personal data. Personal data is information from which a living individual can be identified. And that includes data where you can put together two pieces of information to a more piece of information which you hold as an organisation in order to identify an individual. The GDPR recognises that in the electronic age, people are increasingly being identified not so much by their name and address, for example, but by perhaps by their online identities. So what is covered by personal data is being widened to explicitly include things like IPR addresses, um, cookies, and, and all of those other monitoring methods which are used online to identify particular individuals. The other thing that's worth bearing in mind is that this particular regime only applies to data which has been processed 
in two particular scenarios. One is where there is automated processing of data, so essentially anything that's using a computer system, and where personal data is being processed within manual filing systems, where data is accessible according to a specific criteria. If you're like me and you have a day book, which includes lots of scribbled notes from telephone conversations, telephone numbers, the odd names, reminders to me to do something, but which I, I would not be able to apply criteria to, to extract information, that is not covered by the um, Data Protection Act at the moment, and it's not covered by GDPR moving forwards. The test we classically use to determine whether something does fall within this manual filing system criteria is to say, if you had a temp in the office, could the temp go and retrieve a specific piece of information if you told them to from the particular filing system in question? It is important, though, to remember that the new legislation, for all its focus on cookies and the internet and electronic data, applies just as much to those files in the filing cabinet and including in the filing cabinet that's been locked for years and nobody's bothered to open it. So it's important to bear in mind that it is paper files um, which are covered as well as electronic data. I've already mentioned this idea that personal data can be information which you um, identify by putting together different pieces of information. And often this is what we call pseudonymized data. Pseudonymized data is a good thing because having your data protected in this way gives it a, a level of security um, and protection which is very important and which goes beyond, for example, simply password protecting a document. So if a, a spreadsheet of names was pseudonymized, for example, there would be no reference to any names and addresses on the face of that document, but perhaps individuals would be identified by numbers. In order to be able to unlock the data, you would require the key, which gives you the identifying information um, relating to those numbers. So it gives an extra layer of security. The ICO and the um, authorities across Europe would like to see more use of pseudonymized data, but it is important to bear in mind that it is still covered. Data which is genuinely completely anonymized is not covered by the Data Protection Act, but that only applies to data where all of the personal um, information in relation to individuals has been stripped out. So it would be statistical information where there is absolutely no way for you to drill back into that data to get to particular individuals. Uh, and it's important to understand that difference between pseudonymized data and anonymized data, which and they do sometimes get slightly confused. Within the general um, data regime, there is a category of data which has special protection attached to it. At the moment, under the Data Protection Act, we call that sensitive personal data. In the GDPR, it's described as special categories of personal data. It means exactly the same thing. The existing list still applies. So it covers things like somebody's um, details about somebody's sex life, their political beliefs, whether they belong to a trade union. Importantly for the sector, it also covers information about medical conditions, and it also covers information about criminal offences or allegations that somebody has committed a criminal offence. That definition of sensitive personal data is being widened by the GP, GDPR to also explicitly include genetic and biometric data. And that reflects the fact that if we go back to 1998, there was um, no such thing as genetic data that would have been readily available. And it's recognising that as we move forwards, it's likely that we will increasingly by, be identified by that sort of information, by organisations, and perhaps particularly by um, various insurers and, um, and similar bodies who'll be interested at looking at that sort of information about us and what, what it can tell them.
So now you understand what personal data is, we have to look at what the principles are under the GDPR. So these are the principles which apply whenever you are processing personal data, regardless of the reason for you processing that. So data must be processed in a way which is lawful, fair and transparent. And that transparent element is very important. And we'll see as we move through that that feeds into increasing obligations for you to provide information about what information um, you have about them and, what inf and how you are using that, who you will share that with. It's important to understand that that transparency is entirely separate from consent which is a condition, but I'm going to return to that theme in a moment. You must have explicit, specified purposes for processing data. You must be clear why you are using it, and that must be documented. You must only use as much data as you need to. That's the principle of data minimization. So you don't process more data than you need to for a particular purpose. It's very important that data is accurate and kept up to date and that you have systems in place which will enable you to check the accuracy of data on a continuing basis. And perhaps one of the issues which in practical terms we see causing some of the greatest difficulties for organisations, your processing of data must be time limited. You must have in place um, policies and uh, approaches to the how long data will be retained and how it will be destroyed in due course. And that means understanding the obligations attached to different sorts of data. So you will not have one single retention period and destruction date for all pieces of information because the obligations which you have to hold it will vary enormously. So, for example, thinking about the people that you care for, there will be information which you hold about those individuals, which you have to have in order to um, provide them with social care services. But as soon as you are no longer caring for them, you have no longer have any need for. You will have records which you're obliged to keep for statutory purposes. Um, and, for example, to satisfy CQC. You will have information which you need to keep um, because the local authority requires you to keep that for a certain period of time under your contract. You will have information which you need to keep for a certain period of time in case the individual later sues you and alleges that you've not provided them with a proper standard of care. And you will have information perhaps about that individual's next of kin and other individuals associated with them. All of those different sorts of data have different obligations attached to them in terms of how long you should hold on to the information. And it's very important that you prepare a detailed and comprehensive retention schedule dealing with all of those different aspects of data and all of the other data that you hold as well. So you have the same sort of approach in relation to um, employee data, for example, and for employee data, you'll have a range of considerations which differ from the person who has applied to you for a job but is unsuccessful, people who are um, successfully appointed, people who are current employees, and people who are former employees. And there'll be some data which you have to keep almost indefinitely, for example, information about pension entitlement. And you need to consider all of these different um, considerations. And finally, you need to ensure that data is held securely. That's securely in a physical sense for um, physical documents, but also securely um, in terms of computer systems. And that's not something which I'm going to talk about any further in this presentation, because obviously it's a complex area and I could spend easily spend an hour talking about um, online data security and electronic security systems, but that's a very important aspect of this, not one that I want to um, play down at all. So the key to understanding what's changing under GDPR um, on 
um, a compliance basis is this obligation to be able to demonstrate compliance on a day-to-day -day basis if you're required to do so. And I think it's important to stress that in terms of social care providers, I think there are two potential developments which I expect to see and indeed we're starting to see already. You can expect CQC and auditors to put a lot of focus on looking at your GDPR compliance, particularly in the early days, and they're going to want to understand what your plan is and how you are going to be able to demonstrate compliance so that there's no danger of you being challenged by the ICO and perhaps incurring a large fine, which could jeopardize um, your um, the, the, the survival of your business moving forwards. There is another aspect too, though. Um, just over the last couple of weeks, the ICO has issued some statements raising concerns about what they perceive as a lack of preparedness amongst local authorities in relation to GDPR, and in particular local authorities not being geared up, geared up enough to deal with breaches. That's important because I think the approach which local authorities are inevitably going to adopt is to put GDPR at the top of their list um, in terms of um, procurement. And that means when you are putting in tenders, you're going to have to be able to demonstrate this compliance regime is being met in full in order for you to be allowed to tender for new contracts, to have contracts extended, um, and it um, is likely to be one of the um, criteria which you will be assessed against. So you will see it coming up in that context, perhaps just as much as you see it um, being dealt with from a governance point of view. So as I explained, in order to be able to process personal data at all, you have to be able to show that you have a processing condition in place. The processing conditions themselves are not changing under GDPR. So if you're familiar with this concept, this bit's going to be very easy for you. As that wheel shows you, um, there are a number of possible conditions for processing personal data rather skipped over the fact that obviously you have to be able to process the data if you're required to do so by a court order and so on. What we often find is that the first condition which occurs to people is consent. So they will ask individuals to consent to the processing of their personal data. And there's then a temptation not to consider any of the other grounds for processing at all. That's the wrong approach to take. That's not only our view within Trowers, it's backed up by the ICO who have stressed on a number of occasions that that is an entirely flawed approach to compliance. Consent should be the last thing you rely on as a processing condition. You should only be considering consent if you cannot rely on one of the other conditions for processing personal data. And in fact, we would expect that within social care, the circumstances in which you are relying on consent are going to be very limited indeed. If you think for a moment about how you deal with your employees, for example, you're processing their personal data for a range of um, requirements. You're processing it, processing it so you can assess their performance to make sure they're doing their, their jobs properly. You're processing their data so that you can pay them. You're processing their data so that you can account to HMRC for tax and national insurance, and of course, numerous other bodies and, and, um, and in numerous other ways as well. All of those um, different ways of processing data are being undertaken because there's a legal obligation, either in statute, like a, uh, your dealings with HMRC, or under the contract of employment in relation to um, performance of duties and in relation to pay. So the reason for processing that personal data is linked to the legal obligation. That is your condition for processing that personal data. You don't need and you should not be seeking consent from employees for that processing. One of the new rights under the GDPR is a right for individuals to withdraw their consent to processing. Clearly, you could not have an individual 
pro withdrawing their consent to you providing data to HMRC um, to meet your tax obligations. And when you look at it that way, you can see how quickly um, that idea falls down. You can also process personal data for to, to protect somebody's vital interests. There are public interest um, requirements, for example, in relation to providing information to the police. Um, and there's a very important one, which, which is where um, you or a third party have a legitimate interest in processing personal data in a particular way. If you're going to rely on the legitimate interest um, condition, you need to balance your legitimate interest against the rights and freedoms of the data subject. So you need to do an explicit balancing exercise and you will be expected to have a record of that as part of your um, being able to demonstrate your compliance. And you're going to have to identify precisely what that legitimate interest is. You can't simply say we have a legitimate interest. You're going to have to provide more information than that in your documentation. And as I've said, um, our view in the ICOs is that it's only if you find that you cannot answer any of those questions in the affirmative that you would go on to seek an individual's consent. You might find, for example, that you think you have a legitimate interest in processing somebody's personal data, but you recognise that your, the, um, your interest in doing that is outweighed by their right to privacy. And this is well demonstrated by the situation which arose in relation to charities. So charities had a legitimate interest in sharing information about potential donors and for contacting um, donors whose names they had obtained from other charities. So they met that part of the test. Where they were criticised by the EACO in relation to um, their um, fundraising was that they didn't take sufficient account of the intrusion of privacy um, of individuals whose data was being processed in that way without them having any idea that their data was being shared or who it was being shared with. And that was why they couldn't rely on the legitimate interests and they need to have consent for those fundraising purposes. But in terms of dealing with service users, families um, and um, employees, it's very rare that consent is ever going to come up. There's a similar set of conditions for processing sensitive personal data. If you're processing sensitive personal data, for example, medical information, you need to have, um, you need to be able to demonstrate that you can show one of these additional conditions. That's in addition to the previous list. As you can see, um, on that list is explicit consent, but perhaps more importantly, Conditions on that list also include processing for employment, social security and social protection purposes. And um, there is also a medical purposes heading. I stress that medical purposes heading includes the provision of social care and the management of social care systems. So most of your processing of medical information, whether that's medical information of employees or medical information of um, the people that you support will be processed under that condition and not under an explicit consent condition. And, and as you can see, there are a number of other possible grounds for processing sensitive personal data as well. All of the principles apply in exactly the same way. Coming on then to breach notifications. This is what you must do if something goes wrong. It might be that um, your computer system is hacked and you know that somebody external to your organization has a, had access to personal data which you hold on your computer systems. A breach can occur in other ways. If a laptop is lost, left in the pub perhaps by somebody, that is a breach. It's a breach if somebody leaves a file on the bus in a plastic bag, or if correspondence is sent to the wrong address. It comes as a surprise to many people that at the moment there isn't actually an obligation to notify a breach to the ICO, it's good practice. And if the ICO become aware of a breach at the moment, which they haven't been told about, which they consider to be serious, 
they have powers to take action, but there's no actual obligation to notify a breach on a precautionary basis. And that is something which is changing under GDPR. You don't have to notify all breaches to the ICO and they won't thank you if you do, but they want to know about breaches which pose a risk to the rights and freedoms of data um, subjects. And if you do decide that you need to notify a breach, you need to do so promptly within 72 hours um, and that is a timeline which is extremely tight and it's why it's very, very important that you ensure that your staff know what a breach is and what to do if a breach arises. It's not uncommon for us to be contacted by organisations at the moment where somebody has realised that something which happened several weeks or even months earlier was actually a personal data breach. And if you were doing that under the new regime, that could have serious consequences. If you do have to notify the ICO, they will expect you to provide details of the breach, what the consequences um, you think are of that breach and the steps that you will take to mitigate that. You don't need to provide all of that information in the, in the first notification to them within the 72 hours. You could tell them that you have had a breach and that you're fully assessing um, the um, circumstances, you'll investigate the cause and you'll provide further information in due course, but you need to make that initial contact within 72 hours from now on. You also have to be prepared to um, contact individuals. The circumstances in which you'll have to notify an individual about a breach is if there's a high risk to their rights and freedoms and you provide them with the same information in terms of what the breach is, what the consequences of it might be and how you're going to mitigate it and you have to do that without undue delay. If you are a data processor for another organisation and one of the things that you will need to consider is the extent to which you are a data processor for the local authorities who are commissioning you to provide social care. Um, if you have a breach in those circumstances, you must notify the data controller without undue delay. It's then for the data controller to determine whether or not they're going to notify the ICO or another supervisory authority. Um, for the, the rest of the time that I have, I'm going to talk about the steps which the Information Commissioner's Office expects you to take. Um, this is, um, um, they have some detailed guidance on, online and it provides a very usual, useful framework for your planning process and um, moving forwards. The first step, which I think most organisations will be well past by now, is having an awareness of the new um, legislation and ensuring that key people and decision makers are aware of what is changing. What is important, of course, is that your board of trustees um, and so on are fully aware of the implications of this legislation as well as um, your ordinary staff and, and your executive teams um, and so on. Perhaps the most significant part of this um, preparation process um, is the next one. It's about understanding the information that you hold. Um, it's something which is very easy to describe and something which I know from working with clients on this, extremely hard to do in practice, but it's something which I'm afraid you do have to do. What you need to do as soon as you can, if you haven't already started this, is to understand exactly what personal data you have, where it came from, and who you share it with. And one of the things that I would stress is the importance of making sure that there is engagement in this assessment process right across the organisation. One of the things which does occasionally cause us some concern is in some um, clients that we've spoken to, the main focus for compliance in relation to GDPR has been placed with um, IT um, departments. And IT departments will be very good at assessing the data which they hold on their computer systems but they aren't going to understand at all what physical records you keep in residents' homes, in the back of your staff car, in, um, in your in filing cupboards, in your, um, in your office, and so on. You may have people's personal data scattered across a wide area containing all sorts of things, and the IT department are not the right people um, to be assessing that. <clears throat> 
Once you've undertaken that huge task, you're then in a position to consider the different elements of compliance which you're going to need to meet moving forwards. And those are, you need to look at how you are communicating privacy information at the moment. I've mentioned already this confusion we see between conditions and principles. Providing privacy information is complying with a principle, but often people have it as part and parcel of a consent form and they think of it as a consent issue, but it's not. It's a communication um, um, of privacy information issue. And this is the information where you will tell people what you have, why you're using it, um, and what they can do if they want to raise any concerns about that. At the moment, you probably provide fairly limited privacy information because that's all you're obliged to do. And this is one of the really, really significant things which is changing under the GDPR. Moving forward, you're going to have to tell people precisely which processing condition you are relying on when you process their information. You are going to have to explain to them who you share their personal data with, what you are doing to hold it securely, how long you are going to hold it for, and who they can complain to, both within your organisation and externally to you, if they're unhappy about the data processing which um, is being undertaken. There is, that's only a very brief summary of the obligations. There is um, detailed information available, obviously within the GDPR itself, um, and you can find more information on the ICO website to tell you exactly what needs to be included um, in that privacy notice. To further complicate matters, the privacy notice must be readily understandable by the person you expect to be reading it, and that obviously is going to um, create particular tensions for you if you um, are supporting people with learning disabilities. So you're going to have to think very carefully about exactly what form those privacy notices take. If you want to have an idea of the sort of approach that you can take to that, um, if you're using Google at the moment, you probably find that ever so often um, a box is thrown up which requires you to scroll through and confirm that you've read it. Um, that is providing you with privacy information from Google about how they are using um, your personal data. So if you want to have a look at a detailed privacy notice, that's actually quite a good place to start. Under the new Data Protection Act, there um, is a new obligation which applies to processing conditions like relying on employment um, and so on. But in order to rely on that condition, you must have policies in place underpinning your data protection compliance. That isn't something which is in um, the GDPR, although I think you can argue that it's implied by GDPR, but it's been made explicit in the new Data Protection Act. And that means it's really important that you get your policies right. Um, and I would recommend putting and um, checking policies and making sure they are fully compliant at the top of your um, compliance plan. When you look at those policies, you need to consider how they are going to reflect people's individual rights. So their rights to access data, their right to have data about them erased, their right to be forgotten if that's what they um, want to do, their right to have incorrect data rectified, to move data if they move to a new service provider, to object to certain sorts of processing, and there are also a new additional rights if you are undertaking automated decision making. Probably doesn't happen so much in the sector, I suspect, unless you have some kind of automated recruitment process. But if you are undertaking automated decision making, do make sure you understand what the additional levels um, of information which you need to um, provide and um, the steps you need to take to comply. Moving forwards, individuals are going to have a right to access um, their personal data um, in a much shorter time scale, so within 28 days rather than the 40 which exists now, and you're going to have to provide that information free of charge. So you need to think about how you're going to meet um, that um, new obligation and what may result in a spike in um, requests for um, subject access coming through. You um, need to make sure that for every single sort of processing that you're undertaking, 
that you can rely on a lawful condition and that that has been adequately documented. And you will use that information to update your privacy notices moving forwards. I've already talked about consent quite a bit, but there are some pointers there for the things that you need to think about. The key one being, do you really need to seek consent at all? And importantly, if you are relying on consent, what are you going to do if somebody withdraws consent? How are you going to withdraw the relevant data from your systems to ensure that you meet that and um, that they're not exercising that right to withdraw their consent moving forwards? If you are dealing with children, you need to think about how um, you are processing their data. You need to be very careful that you provide them um, with information in a form which they can understand. You don't need parental consent, though, for processing children's data unless you're processing data ch um, for children under the age of 13. Um, children between the ages of 13 and, and 16 can consent to um, processing of personal data. And actually, if you receive something like a subject access request from um, a parent for an older child, you need to also check that the child is happy for their data to be shared in that way. They have individual um, data rights in their own right and they should be allowed to um, express those. And the last um, set of things which you need to think about, I've already talked about data breaches. Obviously it's important that you ensure that you can detect data breaches quickly and report them within that 72 hour timescale if you need to. And you also need to think about exactly how you are going to investigate data breaches moving forward. Are you, for example, going to have a specific um, identified person within your organization who will have that responsibility? But what will you do when a team member discovers that there may have been a breach, perhaps on a Saturday evening? So you need to think about how you will investigate and report breaches at, at all of the points where they could arise. I mentioned data protection by design early on. One of the ways that you will be able to achieve ensuring that you have privacy systems designed for your organization will be by undertaking data protection impact assessments. And you should undertake a data protection impact assessment moving forward whenever you start processing data in a new way or you introduce a new system. There's an ICO code of practice in relation to undertaking a data protection impact assessment, also called a privacy impact assessment. And that guide is really quite good and, and easy to read and sets out exactly what you need to do. When it comes to data protection officers, this is a new um, statutory role, although I know there will be lots of data protection officers um, across the sector already. Um, this has a new statutory meaning. It means somebody who has direct reporting responsibility to the board. Um, they will have the primary responsibility for reporting breaches and for interaction with the supervisory authorities. You have to have a data protection officer if you are a public authority, and that means you're covered at the moment by the Freedom of Information Act, or if you're undertaking high risk processing that's a question of looking at either the volume or the nature of the processing of the data which you have and it will be a matter for your board to decide whether or not you do need a data protection officer. Those data protection officers have a particular statutory role as I've said and they do have certain protections and rights for example in relation to um, training and so on. The very last point to make is in relation to international data transfers, probably not something which is going to come up in the sector very much but if you do have an organ, if you are an organisation which processes data um, across international boundaries. You need to consider who the appropriate um, lead authority is going to be. In the unlikely event that you are processing um, and sending a data out outside the EU, it's very important that you're aware of the obligations which apply to third country transfers. I'm not going to talk about that here, but if it's something which may apply to you, it is very important that you make sure you're fully compliant in relation to that. Breach of the third party, the, the third country provisions is something which could trigger a very substantial fine if you breached it, because once data goes outside the protection of the EU, 
um, it is recognised that in, to a large extent it becomes much harder to control. So the authorities are particularly concerned about that happening in an unregulated way. There's a lot to cover with GDPR and that's really just a taster of the key principles. I would strongly recommend the ICA website for anybody who's looking for more information. They're adding to that all the time um, and they have some fantastic information resources if you need them. Um, and in the meantime, thank you for your attention and, and I hope to speak to you again soon. Um, hello, hello. Thank you so much for that. That's that's brilliant. It's, I'm sure a lot of our members will be very interested in all this very useful information. Um, I do have a couple of questions, if that's okay. Have you got time to answer them? That would be, that would be great. Um, my first question is something very specific to our, to our sector. Uh, what does the GDPR say about obtaining consent from vulnerable adults and children? The short answer is um, that the GDPR doesn't actually deal with questions of capacity at all. It, it looks at the situation for children, but it doesn't refer to vulnerable um, adults at all. What that means is that you're falling back on general principles in relation to capacity. And of course, you really have to question, um, it will depend on each individual um, service user, but there are going to be significant problems in terms of ensuring that somebody does have capacity to consent to processing of personal data, which might be really quite complex and um, principles to understand. And that's one of the reasons why we would stress trying to um, ensure that all of your processing is relying on another sort of condition. Um, but what you do still need to do is to provide them with information about how you are processing um, their data. And that means providing privacy notices, which are really clear and easy to understand. And at this point, I will confess that as a lawyer, I'm probably not the best person to speak to about this. I know within your organisations, because I've spoken to people about it, you have fantastic expertise in communicating really quite difficult ideas um, to vulnerable people. Uh, you need to make sure, though, that I think that a lot of thought goes into how that um, information is going to be communicated. And you'll need to have separate communication with families as well. You'll probably be... Um, using two sets of privacy notices for service users and for the families and, and bear that in mind. Oh, brilliant, thank you very much for that. Um, my final question is about in your experience what are organisations finding most difficult in preparing for the GDPR? I think there is this new um, practical exercise in finding just what personal data they have and I think and um, speaking to people who are going through this process, what many people have commented on is just how much data they have about people on their systems that they never really realise they have and where it's tucked away. But I think the biggest challenge that I'm seeing and the thing which we're having the most questions about is in relation to um, retention schedules, understanding how long people have to um, hold on to data and exactly what they need to do um, in relation to that. I think. One of the things which I would really encourage in terms of um, LDE members is to speak to each other, find out what other organisations are doing and learn from each other. Within the housing sector, for example, there is a, a nationally recognised retention schedule which housing associations tend to use. And I think the social care sector would probably benefit from a similar sort of um, sector-wide approach in relation to information and how long it's held for. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for participating in the session and thank you, Helen, for taking the time to share your experience and knowledge with us. The session has been recorded and a copy will be sent to all attendees. Um, thank you once again and hope you enjoy some near future for a new event.